Hello, everyone. Um, just, um, I've just, just pressed the start button to let everyone in, but um, we'll, we'll start in about a minute just to, to make sure everyone's comfortable and join us, because I know um, it takes a few seconds for the uh, technology to work sometimes. So um, we'll, we'll make sort of proper introductions in a, in a, in a minute or so. Thanks. I'm going to make a start because I know um, a few people are going to join us um, um, over the course of the next few minutes, but um, it will be good to sort of get introductions and things out of the way before we, we crack on. So um, welcome everyone to this um, second webinar on um, retrofit, refurbishment and repurposing, the three R's. Um, second in, in a series of seven, looking at this, different aspects of this, of this topic. Um, I'm Martin Hamilton, Director of Leeds Civic Trust, and this is something that you know, is, of, is of increasing interest to us as we look at planning applications and presentations from developers. We're increasingly seeing proposals to reuse buildings rather than demolish them. So it's, um, yes, Susan, I will put captions on in a second. Sorry about that. Um, but um, so, so yes, um, it, this is a topic that we're particularly interested in. Um, so um, what we will do over the course of the next um, hour or so, we'll have a series of presentations. We'll invite people to um, chat uh, using the chat function or using the Q&A. Um, and then at the end of the presentations, we will um, hopefully have time for a bit of discussion and, 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 uh, and um, question Q&A and that sort of thing. So that's the, that's the plan. Um, and I'm just gonna try and switch on the... That should have worked. It has worked. So uh, the captions are now switched on. So people who need to uh, use the captions, um, they're not always they're not always one hundred percent accurate, are they? But um, it, at least it means that you can get the gist of what we're saying. Um, so uh, I'm delighted. First of all, can I just say, Claude, um, uh, thank you uh, for um, all your efforts in 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 pulling together this series of webinars. Claude uh, is is a member of the Civic Trust Planning Committee. Uh, an architect and an and, and academic and has a particular interest in this topic um, and so I think we were uh, we're very much indebted to her for um, identifying speakers and, and put, putting together this program um, and we will be recording this session so um, I know lots of people who can't attend uh, who've registered who, who said could you could you could they please watch the session uh, afterwards so we will be recording it and putting it on on YouTube uh, in the course of the next few days um, but just to just very, very briefly, I just want to introduce um, our three speakers. So Oriel Prizman, professor uh, from Cardiff University, um, she's going to kick off uh, the, the, the talks today. Um, we've then got Pat Evers from kind of design uh, just across the, the river from where I'm sitting now. Um, uh, very welcome. Uh, very very you know, welcome to, to Pat for, uh, for coming. And, and I know he's got some interesting things to say. Uh, and then Hannah Keithley from Civic Engineers. I'm not going to say any more than that by my introduction because I think I'll leave it to you to say a bit more about who you are and what you do and what your interests are, if that's if that's okay. So without further ado then, um, uh, Oriel, over to you. I've enabled the share screen, um, so that should work. And um, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see that now? Um, we can. Good. Um, okay, hello. Um, I don't know how many everyone there are there. Um, my name is Oriel Prizman. I'm from Cardiff University Centre for Sustainable Building Conservation. And um, we basically are a newly formed group. Um, I set up this MSc at Cardiff 10 years ago. 
um, which specifically looked at the issues around conservation um, in relation to sustainability. And there is a edited book which includes um, an essay. I think um, Claude was looking for some building physics. Um, there is an essay in there um, by Simon Lannan, a colleague, um, which looks specifically at defending the use of SAP calculations, the um, standard assessment procedure. Um, my contribution to that was looking back on work I'd done in practice as an architect and critiquing presumptions um, over four projects. Um, the final one being a replacement house where using um, Cambridge City Council's planning policy for sustainability, um, I justified the replacement of an existing house specifically in terms of its future energy use. But the conclusion of that chapter is really to say that, um, and the other two diagonally rewrap and reinstate are two other projects, but that the, the primary um, success in terms of considering a, a sustainable solution was the first one, reorder, which is, um, work I did to a clunch house which had lived, had no water, electricity or gas and somebody living in it till 1996 and then kind of added to in order to provide services. But um, so it's really about trying to develop um, approaches to that aspect of the domestic side of things. But looking more at public buildings, I'm going to just use this time to talk about the findings from one quite large scale project I've done at Cardiff, um, which looks at all of the Carnegie Library buildings in the UK. Um, the principle behind looking at that is that they were two and a half thousand buildings whose designs were judged um, in America by the Carnegie Foundation. And therefore, one of the first examples of really standardized building elements um, and approaches to design being used transatlantically. Um, so you do get this thing where you'll have two buildings which apparently look quite different here. We've got Burnley and Battersea Libraries, but they share um, exactly the same roof light from the same manufacturer. So therefore, there's a kind of means to intervene, I guess. Um, but what's interesting at that time is that not only were the architects very local to the places where they were working, but the buildings were still using um, effectively local materials. So you can very much see the correlation between um, the brick and the stone and so forth um, with the different parts of the country where these buildings were built. Um, and this means that when we did life cycle and analysis of Toxteth Library, which incidentally isn't actually a Carnegie Library, but he approved it, he opened it, and he said it was the, one of the best designs for a model library. Um, we found that, um, and we did this in comparison with a new building of the same size, that um, the, the things that really contributed to its longevity were in fact the um, parquet floors, which have lasted for over a hundred years, but also the fact that the brick, which is, um, you know, two skins of six inch brick, um, so substantial walls, but built from local sources. So uh, basically the, the argument for taking into account whole life assessment is, is incontrovertible. Um, Another thing that is slightly unexpected is that looking at um, the energy use of all the Carnegie Library buildings across um, England and Wales, you can see that they actually outperform the um, display energy certificates for public buildings in general. And finally, the, the slightly more complicated thing I wanted to put across was um, if you look at the um, SIBSI um, presumptions effectively for 
the expectations of energy use um, in the chart at the bottom here, D. Um, it, the shading is indicating the latitude of the buildings um, going from left to right. You get a very even presumption of what the energy use to be, would be. But if we look in actuality at those um, buildings, you'll see at the top, um, looking at floor area, there's not really any correlation in terms of the energy use. If you look at annual electricity use um, in B, again, there's no real correlation. And C, looking at heating. So a presumption that basically because the building is further north than south, um, it's going to use a different amount of heat is not correct or electricity, um, nor is that of the floor area, apparently. Um, so the other news that comes of this is these buildings, which um, I should stress are, are managed under quite um, severe um, financial challenges across the country, um, shows that their heating usage actually exceeds current um, good practice guidance um, on average. Um, and that if we look at the buildings who's across the UK who um, exceed the good practice that's coming up for 2020, um, or came out in 2020, um, you get quite an unexpected bunch of buildings that on face value, apart from perhaps Walsall, which has been recently refurbished, um, you, um, and Harrogate actually too, but if you look at these buildings, you wouldn't presume them to be in the top end of um, their energy use being for heating, being better than other things. Same thing applies, in fact, in more um, emphasis for electrical because these buildings were designed to be naturally lit. Um, and you can see here again a fairly unexpected group of buildings which are um, exceeding current guidance. So presuming um, that buildings that look um, as if they were designed for another agenda um, underperform is a, is a bad assumption. So that's really the point of this, yeah, um, offering. Um, and to kind of add to that, when we think about building performance, this is Walthamstow um, Library, which is a um, part of London that is not um, well served for public spaces and is not in a high economic standing, but it ranked 13th of over 3,000 public libraries in 2019 in terms of the number of visits it had. So you've got to think um, this building, which was originally built in 1894, is, um, is actually doing an incredible job. Um, and because it's naturally lit, there are actually benefits to that. So um, think carefully about the way forward. Um, there's a free, download on our website, the project website, which is a book of all the Carnegie libraries in the UK. Um, and I think it's quite interesting just to reflect because when you look at the insides, you see something that is very familiar, but might be quite a way away. Um, so there I go. That was, uh, that was fascinating, Oriel. Um, before we move on, uh, just a couple of questions from me. Um, the when you look at the interiors of the, the the Carnegie libraries, I mean they do bear. I mean they they are library buildings, so there are certain characteristics that you would expect to see, and you you do see it in in other libraries that aren't Carnegie, don't have the Carnegie oh, yeah. badge. Mm -hmm. um, but was there something you talked about the fact that they were all built to a um, a standard? With, with, stand, with a standard set of principles. Do those principles, do you think, apply to other public buildings of the same same era? Absolutely. I mean, that was kind of the reason for focusing on them specifically. They, Because they bring, libraries are so designated, they've got to have all these features, um, but also because they were judged by one thing, 
and they all happened in a very short space of time, um, you can kind of pull them together, whereas railway stations don't necessarily all happen at the same time. But yes, this period of time leading up to the First World War, um, there was extraordinary um, amount of building work going on in the UK. All our public buildings got a kind of boost at that time. Um, the the um, building trade skills were amazing, but also the materials. And we it was at the sort of golden age of um, the end of the industrial revolution effectively. So um, the patent elements, yes, you find them in swimming pools, courthouses, all sorts of things, schools. Um, the focus on the Carnegie thing is just literally that it is a kind of channel into um, finding common elements. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, we, we're going to be coming on to skills and, and trade uh, issues um, at a future t webinar in terms of the what, what skills we currently have compared, but I guess, with the skills that were available when some of these buildings were, for, were actually built. Um, did, did you, um, I, I mean, the examples that you show there appear to be of uh, buildings that are still used, at least in part, as libraries, mm. um, or, or certainly public buildings, but... Um, are there examples of Carnegie libraries that have moved moved on into different uses, and were they were they looked at as part of a study, and how did they perform? I didn't um, I didn't look at them in terms of the study, partly because um, well I did look at what they'd been turned into, and if you look on the website, I've got all the data. If it's not on the website, it's in some of the papers that are linked to on the website. But we know. Mm -hmm what things have been predominantly they get converted to offices but there's residential and so forth and um but because they were being used in different ways it's not i couldn't get the same comparable data so i didn't go into the same thing with looking at their um, energy certificates and so on um but i don't think there's any harm in taking some principles out of it and and presuming that those things would apply um, in the in the case of a, any building that's similar or of similar date with similar features, um, the, I think the one thing that is really underestimated is the contribution of natural light. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess many of these buildings are listed. They are. They are. And obviously, the main issue is leaky, cold roof lights being blocked off in the sixties, and um, you know they were built at a time when flat roofing was a kind of new innovation and um, mm. we all know what that means. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Claude, any, any comments for you before we move on? Uh, I was interested in um, whether you found similar performance criteria all across, despite the fact that they were all built slightly differently because mm. they were built by local builders with local mm. materials. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't looked in, we haven't done um, life cycle analysis of more than just the cost, the Toxteth building, but I can correlate the instances of the features. We've, correl we've networked all the features in the different libraries. So I think you can make some presumptions um, going across the other buildings, you know. Um, that's very interesting. Yes, yes. Um, okay, well, we'll 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 hopefully have some time at the end just to sort of look at some of the, the themes that are, that are coming out of uh, what we're going to be hearing over the next um, your your talk in the next half hour. But maybe we'll move on to Pat now to to talk about. A, I think you're going to talk about a particular building that uh, your practice um, uh, has been working on, and I guess this is an example, isn't it, of. Um, uh, one use and, and moving to another use and um, interesting to, to think about the environmental um, you know, impact, if you like, of, of, of that conversion. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll let, you, uh, let you crack on that. Thank you. Thanks for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, so just um, to, to uh, start again, uh, so I'm Patrick Evers, the Director at Cunniff Design in Leeds, uh, who um, and we've been corporate mem members of the trust for uh, well since our inception in, in 2015. So we you know we really enjoy sessions like this. So it's a pleasure to to take part. Um, as Martin said, the, the the case study I'm going to look at is the conversion of Brotherton House 
um, which is underway now on site actually. We've been involved with for the past couple of years. So you can see it on the on the image here, hopefully outlined in, in white. For those, um, just sorry, just a bit of a quick background to Cunniff Design. Um, Rob Cunniff set up the practice in 2015 uh, after both of us had worked at Carey Jones for sort of over 15 years, uh, where we've sort of combined um, sort of design-led approach with, with sort of commercial uh, projects. And we wanted to continue that sort of ethos of working closely with clients, um, but it's about enjoying the process as much as the sort of end product. Um, in terms of uh, Brotherson then, for those of you who aren't familiar with where it is in Leeds, uh, we've got the site outlined in red here. It's at the end of St. Paul Street, at the end of the hedgerow near the Westgate roundabout. So it's probably a building you're familiar with um, for sort of seeing in sort of fairly sorry state. It's had green netting on it for, for many years to keep the pigeons out, um, but it's hopefully um, destined for a brighter future now. Um, just interestingly, it's, uh, it originally it was built on the edge of a large roundabout, as you can see on the photo here. Um, but that was, in, that was sort of short-lived, as you can see, the inner ring road was cut through with its tunnels, which, which come under here. Um, and so it's kind of rather abandoned from its original um, setting. Uh, on the Ordnance Survey map here, you can see the red um, ownership boundary, uh, which includes this turning circle, which uh, is used for parking at the moment, but will become the, the site for the new tower that sits alongside the existing building. Um, so since 2012, the building's been owned by Pullen & Sons. Uh, Jay Pullen & Sons are a family development company based in Leeds. Um, and they're now located at Joseph's Well, which is just across the, the ring road from uh, Brotherton House. Uh, they've been looking for a suitable development partner for some time. And in 2019, they joined forces with Study Inn. Uh, Study Inn are a developer and operator of student accommodation based in Coventry. Uh, they have centres across the country. And um, <clears throat> they entered into a joint venture with Pullens to, um, to de deliver the, a new scheme. Um, they, Pullens retained the freehold of, of Brotherton House and study in will take a long lease to develop and operate it. Uh, it's worth explaining our, our role in the project because um, we're sort of limited from our normal services that we'd undertake uh, as architects. Study in have their own in-house designers uh, and produce room layouts and the, and the fit out design. So we're sort of limited to um, achieving planning consent and um, designing the external envelope and you know, the, the sort of external features of the building. Uh, we also don't have any site duties, which is quite unusual for us. So all of the sort of site inspection and quality control stuff that we would normally do is undertaken by, um, by this main contractor. So a bit of history about the building um, and the people behind it. Uh, the Brotherton Company was established in the 1870s in Wakefield uh, by Edward Allen Brotherton, um, who at 22 bought an existing chemical company in Wakefield, which was utilising the byproducts of the region's coal mines. Uh, over the following years, uh, he transformed the company, uh, setting up six regional sites and became a significant benefactor to charities and institutions in the area uh, and something of a model employer as well. So probably two notable examples that you might be familiar with are the Brotherton Wing of the, of the Leeds General Infirmary and the Brotherton Library uh, in, at Leeds University, uh, the former being in a sort of similar Art Deco style to, to Brotherton House. Um, the building itself was conceived before the war, <clears throat> shortly after Edward's death in 1934, but it wasn't built until after the war, uh, when the company was led by Charles Brotherton. The building uh, was designed by uh, Victor Bain, who was a notable architect in Leeds at the time, and was uh, West Yorkshire Society for Architects uh, president for 10 years from 1934. And as you can see, it's designed in a sort of mid-century international style with, with some Art Deco sort of flourishes. Um, the construction of the building was eventually completed in 1955 by George Wimpey, uh, and Pullens retained a lot of the original contract documents, which have been a sort of invaluable um, resource for understanding the, the existing building fabric. So after seven years um, of occupation by Brotherton, the building was sold to Leeds Corporation in 1962, and Leeds City Police occupied the building as their HQ until 2008, uh, when the building was last in occupation. So the building today um, is, is in a relatively sort of sorry state with graffiti and, and netting uh, adorning it, um, but it's actually constructed from very high quality materials and, and, and is you know, in a robust sort of condition. Uh, we've got red sort of multi-brick forming the majority of the building in a, in a Flemish bond. We also have a green Westmoreland slate and limestone tiles. We have Italian quartzite surrounds to the windows and white painted metal uh, window frames. Uh, the image on the right actually shows a, a sample area that's been cleaned. I don't know if you can sort of make out that the, the materials around the edges are darker. So we've got 
the brickwork here, which is uncleaned, and then the cleaned portion here. Similarly with the Westmoreland slates and the limestone tiles. Uh, and so you can really see the, sort of the vibrancy that's going to be brought back uh, once the building's complete and completely cleaned down uh, and brought back into, into use. Uh, when we became involved in 2019, uh, the building was largely stripped out. Uh, the concrete clad steel frame was in good condition and most of the um, main structural walls still remained. Uh, due to being unheated and uh, partly open to the elements, much of the parquet flooring was, uh, was damaged and peeling paint and plaster were sort of typical throughout. Uh, but despite its condition, some important features still uh, remained in the building. Uh, probably the most notable feature uh, for externally are the two semicircular staircases at either end of the building. Uh, and their mosaic flooring and the um, sort of Art Deco balustrading that you can see uh, still remain and they will be retained and refurbished as part of the finished building. Uh, the only sort of room that really is still exists on its own is the boardroom on the first floor, which features quite ornate panelled oak doors, um, we've got built-in sort of secret um, compartments in the walls, parquet flooring and so on. And this will be retained as part of the um, amenity offer for the students within the building. There's also some of the original fixtures and fittings, um, such as controls that you can see here for the um, forced air system that was introduced in the building. It's quite innovative in its time. And things like signage, uh, we've re retained all of these and they'll be reused as part of the interior design to give that connection to its, um, to its history. Uh, we undertook a, uh, a sort of an audit of all the sort of historic features that were still in the building at the time, although there weren't many. Pullens were keen to retain as much as possible um, to give that link to the building's history. So I'll talk you through a bit about the design process uh, and the brief we had from um, Study In, and then I'm going to move on to sort of technical solutions uh, beyond that. It's probably worth noting um, before we do that the, uh, the heritage status of the building. Uh, it, Brunton House is a non-designated heritage asset. Uh, which means that whilst it's not listed um, and having the statutory sort of protections that that gives it, uh, it nevertheless has been flagged by Leeds City Council as a, as a building with historic sort of importance. And this designation flags it as such to the Planning Committee and the Civic Trust when, when they get to um, see the scheme come through. Um, so as part of the um, early pre-app that study in made in 2019 was to look at the, you know, how the, 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 the new and the old could sit side by side. Gunniff Design became involved in 2019 when that first sort of feedback came through and study in had submitted a pre-app which was based on this option here which puts some additional floors on top of the building and then a new sort of annex wing to the side of the same height. Uh, the early feedback was resistant to this approach um, in favour of sort of keeping the existing building uh, you know in its current form and having new accommodation to the side in a separate building. So um, we um, sort of discussed and agreed this with um, through the plans panel process and ended up with this solution where we had a taller tower to the side with a clear separation between the two and the existing building was left intact, uh, albeit apart from the uh, extension on level five, which was a later addition and is in poor condition and needs, uh, needs replacing. So um, this was presented through to the Civic Trust plans panel as well and we gained useful feedback about sort of use of materials and the form of massing, which um, led into a sort of successful scheme. Uh, this in initial sort of consultation is always invaluable and we were able to establish some key parameters about the height of the new block, how we were to separate the two elements and how they would work uh, together for the benefit of the existing setting. So the final form of the new tower was to be a sort of simple modern style which didn't detract from the busy facade of the existing building and using high quality sort of simple materials uh, to be robust in its harsh environment, obviously sat next to the ring road, got noise and pollutants and things so it had to deal with that, uh, that setting. Uh, this is just a typical floor layout showing the um, uh, creation of student accommodation sort of within the existing building. We've then got the new tower at sort of 90 degrees to the existing with a, with a gap between the two and a single story entrance block linking both buildings. And here um, are the images of how the final buildings will look. So you can see Brotherton House on Gray Street here with a single story linking block and the tower next door. And we're actually on site at the moment. So if you go down to the end of St Paul Street, you'll see uh, uh, a lot of activity kind of currently underway. Um, so I'm now going to sort of talk you through the sort of technical aspects of how we achieved um, sort of compliance uh, with the various sort of policies and, and how we dealt with the fact that we, we're dealing with a refurbishment of, a, of a, an important heritage building. There's two sort of primary policy regimes which control building development um, and they're not always complementary. One is building regulations, obviously, the other being planning policy. 
uh, in 2008, uh, the introduction of the Climate Act brought uh, policy change at a national level. And the Act committed the UK to reducing its greenhouse uh, gas emissions by 80% uh, by 2050, uh, compared to 1990 levels. Uh, and this was updated in 2019, when the UK became the first major economy to commit to uh, being net zero by 2050. For the construction industry, this meant a change in, in part um, to the building regulations in Part L, which is the, the approved document which governs uh, the conservation of heat and power. And the Brotherton proposals were calculated under Part L2A uh, for the 2016 amendments. Um, in terms of sort of planning policy, in March 2019, Leeds City Council declared a climate emergency in the city, uh, and this set in train a raft of policy reform right across the authority uh, for the city to become carbon neutral by 2030 and the powers and funding from central government to help make this happen. Uh, in planning and development terms, this led to more demanding minimums for energy efficiency of buildings old and new. In fact, the planning uh, policies that we had to uh, sort of commit to were, were more onerous uh, than uh, the building regulations at the time. So the policies we had to um, comply with were EN 1, 2 and 4, which are to do with carbon reduction, sustainable construction and district heating. Um, and that uh, demands that we, we achieve a 20% improvement in terms of the um, tons of carbon used based on a, on a 2016 baseline. And it also requires that we have at least 10% of our energy um, sourced from low zero and carbon sources, and also to utilize district heating where possible. Um, so I'll talk through the assessment method of, of how um, we sort of go about trying to make those savings, the sort of sequential sequence. Uh, and it's a system called Lean, Clean and Green, which you might have heard of. As the diagram shows, uh, there are greater benefits um, taken from the early sort of passive lean um, methods where, you know, it's about creating uh, an efficient envelope, the siting of the building, uh, it's overheating and it's window design and so on. Being clean is about decentralized energy um, from uh, 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 sort of um, community sources and being green is about low zero carbon and renewable energy sources. So we start with the baseline and uh, this calculated um, through uh, an energy model, that the, the proposals would create um, 160 tonnes of carbon a year based on 2016 criteria. So we then go through um, the lean, clean and green sequence to see how we can save uh, and achieve the 20% plus um, target. So starting with the lean aspects, these are the passive methods, as I mentioned. And for us as architects, that usually comes down to U values, which are the way we calculate the thermal resistivity, resistivity of the external envelope. Um, now, the way the modeling was undertaken was that it dealt with the, the new building and the refurbishment um, separately, so that we, um, we had more stringent targets, targets for the new building, and they were more relaxed for the existing building. Because to achieve um, the, the sort of modern targets with the existing building uh, would, would be quite onerous in terms of the existing um, envelope makeup. For example, it would require us to add on, a, say, an additional 200 millimetres of insulation on the inside of the building, which, aside from taking up floor space, means that um, it doesn't always um, work in terms of how the envelope breathes and where the condensation sits within there. So it wasn't always necessarily easy to, to do that as, as, a, as a starting point. So we have two sets of U values, um, and the new building works harder to, to, to help the, uh, the existing building. And through um, these calculations and targets, we were able to save um, just over 12 tonnes uh, of carbon, which is nearly an 8% improvement. So it's still some way off the 20% that we're looking for. Uh, moving on to the sort of the next category of clean, uh, obviously Leeds benefits from a, a district heating network now. As you can see on this map, the, the thick orange line is the, is the route, and here's our building down here. Um, and at the time, although there isn't a proposed extension near our building, at the time, we weren't able to take the benefit of that due to the uncertainty of when it might come on stream. Um, so, uh, and also in terms of combined heat and power as a, as a, as a decentralized energy option, um, due to the relatively small scale of the scheme and the large space, space demands for, um, for the plant, it wasn't really possible to incorporate that within the scheme. So from the clean aspects, we weren't able to save any uh, carbon uh, or percentage improvement. So the green aspects had to do quite a bit of work. So looking at zero uh, and low carbon technologies, obviously we, we sort of appraise all of the sort of standard available um, technologies that, that there might be, but typically in an urban setting, photovoltaics and air source heat pumps are the two that, um, that, work, that work best. So once we've calculated the amount of um, PV we could have on the roof and the appropriate amount of air source heat pumps, we were able to save 25 tons of carbon, which was equated to about 17% improvement. So looking at that overall as a summary, 
The baseline was 160 tonnes of carbon. And when we added together the lean and the green savings, we, we got down to um, 123 tonnes. So a saving of nearly 38 tonnes and a 24, nearly 25% uh, improvement. So, you know, pre pretty well over the, over the target. So it was a good uh, achievement to, to get to. So I think just sort of in summary, uh, whilst the sort of policy landscape is becoming increasingly uh, demanding to achieve net zero, I think there are still many ways to achieve significant savings and some technologies which are currently unviable uh, will undoubtedly become more attractive over time. And as we've seen over the last sort of 20 or 30 years, new regimes, you know, they always seem daunting at first, but there's, then there's always a way to achieve the targets in the end once they're understood better. And I think what's becoming increasingly important in this discussion of existing buildings uh, is their reuse in their own right and the appraisal of the, you know, the saved embedded carbon in existing buildings, which will surely become increasingly important to, you know, in this discussion, because it's obviously the most lean aspect of them all, you know, in terms of sort of passive savings. So uh, thank you very much. That's the, the end of my talk. Thanks, Pat. That was that was great. Um, it's um, it's a fascinating um, uh, scheme. This, uh, particularly when you see the, um, the slides from the early seventies. I guess it would have been when it when it had a very quite a grand, albeit a roundabout, quite a grand setting, and then. As we can see now, the inner ring road sort of cuts through it. Um, and the fact that this is a building that was designed, you know, pre-war and built, opened, what, 20, more than 20 years after, which is, you know, which I think did happen quite a bit, but it, it, it's still quite unusual. Um, I mean, from, it, from a general perspective, Pat, in terms of your practice and the work that you're doing and, and, and the work that is coming through, are you finding a sort of a change in terms of, attitudes from developers and owners about the, 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 the value of retaining versus demolishing? Yeah, I think it's always something that's been, um, you know, uh, considered at an early stage, but it's definitely become more of a clearly a hot topic at the moment. Um, and so I think the, you know, the sort of feasibility of retaining uh, existing buildings seems to be um, taken more seriously now. And so they're sort of scrutinised more at an early stage. So I think, you know, I think we'll see that happen, you know, more and more uh, over years to come. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of this particular building, I mean, um, you know, it, it's it's I guess it's um, it's a re it, well it it covers it covers the um, the three the three elements of the of this webinar series. It's retrofitting, it's reusing, it's refurbishing. Um, I mean, how in, in terms of the reuse side of things, um, are there sort of compromises that have had to be made? particularly from a sort of an efficient energy efficiency or a, an environmental performance point of view to, to convert from, you know, office, essentially office accommodation uh, to um, uh, small, you know, small, uh, smaller, a series of smaller rooms to accommodate um, the, the, the end users, the, the you know, residential use, or, or has it actually been relative, has the sort of reuse and uh, conversion been relatively is it relatively straightforward and isn't it sort of com is it not compromising things well as i sort of explained in the in the u value scenario i suppose we were quite lucky in the sense that we had a new building to sort of help help us yes. out in terms of you know being able to overperform on the tower yes if we were struggling to to achieve um targets on on the existing building um and, and i think with a lot of you know um repurposing of existing buildings it depends what the use was and what the new use is going to be and what the the shape of the building and how that works with with each use we were quite lucky with that sort of the plan depth of this building sort of suited you know residential or student accommodation use um quite well and the position of windows and things very naturally you know lent itself to being sort of subdivided in the way it's, it, it is being so from that point of view it, it it was relatively straightforward but i think that that that's another sort of limiting factor if you have for example a very deep plan building you're trying to convert to residential then that doesn't always work so it's not just the thermal performance of the envelope, it's about the shape and position and, and windows and lots of other things as well. Um, Linda has asked about green, you know, the, the roof and whether there were any opportunities to um, to, to, to have a um, some sort of green element to the roof. Was that was that looked at at all? It was, yeah. The, the upper roofs aren't really suitable because they're not the, for sort of, um, well, they're not for public access. I appreciate you can still have a green roof um, without it, but on the main roofs of, of both buildings, we've got photovoltaics to, to give us the low carbon um, energy source. Uh, on the roof of the um, single story linking block, we are having a planted uh, landscape roof there, 
obviously to help us with our um, um, biodiversity. And we're also landscaping a lot of the area around the building, which is actually outside the ownership as uh, leading to council land. But we're going to be landscaping and bringing that into a, you know, so we're improving the setting and the economy of the, uh, the building uh, as well anyway. Claude, any, any comments? Um, the, did you actually do an assessment before and after or of, of the, the building? Because obviously you identified lots of positives that were pre-existing before putting in additional technologies. So did you do a formal assessment or did you um, make it in a more uh, intuitive way? And there was a formal assessment done originally by the engineers in terms of how the buildings perform um, and then you know how we needed to achieve the, the sort of savings um, you know to, to meet the meet the policy. Right and Oriol you you didn't mention um, the addition of new technologies is this something you would uh, advocate in some cases? Yeah yeah definitely and in the paper about Toxteth um, I do mention the fact that there is a very very large wind farm um, at the end of the Mersey which um, when you think that what you're really talking about is um, the consumption of energy at a known rate going forward um, thinking about how you attach yourselves to another scale of energy that is perhaps outside the calculation that, um, as Patrick was talking about, um, you know, taking things to a bigger scale. Um, absolutely. And I just want, if I can say one thing about what you were presenting, um, the, I think it's really fascinating the way that, um, sentiment is changing towards um, when you talked about like the signage and the light switches and so on. I think, you know, probably 20 years ago, everyone would have laughed at you to say, we're saving these signs. And um, I think that's a very encouraging thing that there's a kind of capacity to, to, to adopt slightly more recent heritage, you know, because um, the instinct has been for a long time to, to push it away to um, you can map when people in the 60s were disgusted by the things that were their grandfather's work, you know, their father's work, but their grandfather's work's fine. And it kind of shifts what we want to destroy is the generation closest to us. And I, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it's relatively recent, you know, it isn't, you know, that is, all right, I suppose it is kind of pre-war, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a pre, it's a pre-war design and a post-war, post-war construction. I, I wonder if, um, yeah, it's an interesting one, that, isn't it? When you have such a gap between the design and the, and the construction, whether there were any changes in, in from a technological point of view, you know, in, t in terms of the, 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 the advances that had been made in those 20 years that changed the approach that was made to the building of it, you know, 20 years after the designs had been produced. I mean, I don't suppose that's something that is easily yeah. to, easy to, to work out, but it's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, well, if you think of, uh, I often talk about Birmingham Library, which was replaced a mm. few times in, what, 100 years. But the, you know, the last brutalist one, um, which is, called a brutalist icon that was originally meant to be covered in white marble but they they cut it out of the budget so it's um it is interesting to look at the intention but it seems that this one they kept it didn't they they got all the westmoreland slate and so on that's pretty generous mm -hmm. yeah, that's right brilliant okay well that was that was that was really a really interesting um uh uh talk on 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 a, on a on a on a very prominent building actually in Leeds and, and, and a building that lots of people will be familiar with but perhaps um won't know that much about the history and and it, it is good that after a number of years in the doldrums it's actually being brought back into use um so final speaker is is, is Hannah Keithley and um Hannah I'll uh, I won't say any more I'll let you crack on thank you thank you very much um I hope you can see my screen now we can. Great. Um, so I'm really excited to, to talk to you about um, the engineering aspects of retrofit, refurbishment and repurposing. 
I've got two really fantastic case studies to shame, um, lots to talk about, so um, I won't hang about. Um, a little bit about me to start with. I'm a civil and structural engineer. Um, I've been working in, in the industry for about, about 12 years now, and I'm a chartered member with both the iStruct team and the ICA, um, and currently an associate with um, civic engineers um, here in Leeds. Um, Civic Engineers founded in 2009 and, and we expanded into Leeds uh, in 2016, other offices in Manchester, London and Glasgow. Um, and the purpose of this, this graphic um, is to try and capture where we want to stand as a company at this, this point of intersection, this sustainable point, um, working towards um, a point of net zero carbon. Um, we can't deny or shy away from the fact that we are in development but we want to work in a way where we do our best to work with the natural environment. So um, before I get onto the case studies, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about carbon and, and Patrick's already mentioned a bit as well. There's a direct link with carbon emissions and climate change. Um, the best thing we could possibly do in the UK for our carbon emissions is to stop building, but it's not going to happen. We could design a building today, which is brilliant, excellent, super high performance using regenerative materials such as timber, but it would still be more efficient to consider retrofitting an existing building, and I'll tell you why. That's because a significant portion of the carbon emissions associated with buildings arise from the materials used and the construction process itself, which is what we can call the embodied energy. Patrick spoke quite a lot in his presentation about the operational energy of a building, so the energy consumed um, as the building operates. And we actually have quite a bit of scope to, to influence, as Patrick has said, the operational energy. We can, we can use more efficient heating and cooling systems, and we can use um, um, renewable energies as well. So as we find that we move, move towards these super high performance buildings, the embodied the embodied energy, the, uh, the energy that, that, that's built in, it's baked into the structure when you build it, is, is more and more significant. And the embodied carbon for these super high performance buildings, it can actually be the equivalent of 20, 30, 40 years worth of its operational emissions. So thinking about where we want to be, the deadline for net zero carbon, retrofitting where possible will be better in terms of climate change. So retro first, that's what we're doing. This is what we should think, be thinking about as retro first. And this is what we've got to work out as engineers, understanding our buildings, understanding the embodied carbon within those buildings. What are the changes we're going to make? What are those improvements? How can we use them, repurpose them, bring them up to date, make them function and make them energy efficient as well. Um, some sketches we've put together. Retro first, it's, it's not just for buildings. We work across the board on urban infrastructure and highways projects as well. We can retrofit the streets. So this sketch aims to show um, maybe a typical um, urban street. We've got maybe a historic building on the left side, side of the street itself, maybe a slightly more office building, so circa 1960s. Um, well, we've we got we've got a lot of hard surfaces here. Um, a key, a key um result of um, climate changes, we're seeing a lot more extreme weather events, flash floods, what is going to hit these buildings, it's going to run off with the potential to overload our existing infrastructures and um, systems. Heat as well, in these, uh, with these record temperatures that we're, that we're seeing, they tended to be found in urbanised areas. So that's where we are, where do we want to be, where's, where's utopia? This, this would be really nice, wouldn't it? Adapting our buildings, adding extra stories, using regenerative materials such as timber, adding green roofs, improving biodiversity, collecting the, the, the water on buildings, slowing it down, not overloading the systems that we've got. Maybe even using basements to attenuate where we can't collect the water on the, on the, on the roof. Retrofitting the streets with a hardwired green infrastructure. Green makes cities cooler, the studies that that show the effects of urban forests and in even small green spaces such as roofs and on the streets have a, have a really impressive contribution to lowering urban heat. On to, on to my first case study. This is Park Hill in Sheffield. 
um, a few people may be uh, familiar with this. Um, a really cool retrofit, uh, retrofit project for us, uh, and one that Civic Engineers has been has been working on for for well over ten years now with um, Urban Splash, and alongside English Heritage as well. So a really amazing concrete landmark, uh, a really ambitious at the time um, in the city uh, residential development built through the 1950s and, and an opening in the 1960s in the heart of Sheffield. A, a really popular place to live in, in its heyday with its streets and the sky and, and a, a true brutalist icon. Um, so this is an example of the framing. It's a really, really brutalist, really stark. It's, it's a reinforced concrete frame with inset balconies that you can see and then um, um, infill panels. Um, with brickwork curtain warning. Um, the streets in the, in the sky that I mentioned, um, literally you could you could get your milk delivered to your door via, via milk for a float with these elevated streets. <coughs> Excuse me. But the development fell on hard times. It was neglected, set to be to be demolished until it was saved through being listed in 1998. And the grade two, grade two star listing was an acknowledgement of the architectural significance of Park Hill, even though there were many that fought against. <coughs> I wanted to see it knocked down. But what a good job that it wasn't. I mean, look, look how much embodied carbon is in there, but it, it did need its identity overhauled. <coughs> so, um, phase one was a complete strip back to the bare frame. And you can really see in this in this image just how much embodied carbon's there to reuse and go out again. We needed to do some um, fairly intensive repairs to the concrete. Um, the steel reinforcement too close to the surface, it corroded, it expanded, popped off the face of the concrete. So yeah, so a, a series of very intensive concrete repairs. But, but honest repairs as well, as you can see here, to make the structure good again. So this was the before, during, and this is the after. So working with urban designers, Studio Eager at West, who are behind this, this, this striking and then really colourful scheme, new glazing, new more efficient glazing. Um, they narrowed off the streets to create more internal space within the residences. Um, a replacement of the balconies as well. In, in the concrete frame, they were just deemed too difficult to repair. If you, if you look at the slenderness of those, those slats in the balconies, they were just um, too difficult to go at. It was absolutely great start, but, but we wanted to do more, which brings us to phase two, which we did with Mikel Rich as architects. For this phase, um, the developers wanted to go faster, so. How, how could we go faster? We get rid of less. So phase two was a light touch approach, which retained all of the existing masonry infill here in the, in the stair core and between the, uh, the apartments as well. And this is the phase two today. So still able to create these, these really fantastic homes, but staying within the confines of the existing structure. Part of the phase two works as well was the restoration of the link bridge um, between phases one and two. And a piece of graffiti here, uh, Claire Middleton, I love you, will you marry me? Um, quite well known, I, I think, to, to those um, who know Park Hill, but unfortunately lost uh, as part of the, um, the restoration works due to the, um, um, the concrete repair works that were carried out. But um, Urban Splash put it back um, in the online. So, talking about heritage, not just the building, the building fabric, but, but what they mean to people as well. And then moving on to phase three, um, this was student accommodation. And on this one, we went one step further and retained even more. So bringing more and more people on board, coming on with what we wanted to do, to fix things and re retain what's there. Phase three, we were able to, we were able to retain the original balustrades, um, people developing skills, new, new, new products coming into light. So yeah, retaining more and more throughout the different phases of the project. Um, 
my next case study that I'd like to show you, this is um, Cannon Green in central London, and it's behind the uh, Cannon Street station. <coughs> it's um, this L show building here, excuse me, uh, 1960s office, pretty, pretty boring concrete frame. Note the facade, it's an extension at ground level. Three stories of basement parking for the 1960s executives driving their, their big cars through central London. And this is what it is now. So working with John Robertson Architects to, to really redesign and transform the building, maximize its potential, see how much we can get out of the structure. Adding extra stories, um, a welcoming entrance with a bar, really opening up at street level. Um, adopting in the basement um, a, a gym and, and cycle parking. Um, the facade, um, I'll just I'll come back to. This is the same facade that was on the previous slide, actually. Um, what they did is they removed this, this mid-height bar, which was um, for the office space where the dado trunking was. So I took that out, put in a small race access floor instead, cleaned it up, new, more energy efficient um, glazing, and um, new facade on the extension as well to, to match with the existing <coughs> and the driver behind that actually was a frugal client there, was, there wasn't a, a sustainability consultant on board for this project um, but it just goes to show that, that that carbon and cost can pull in the same direction especially when you're talking about existing buildings um, so a summary of what we did here We've added um, additional stories on top of the existing building to increase the, the lessable space. Um, added a, a wraparound um, extension at ground level um, for the entrance and a change of use um, for the basement areas as well. So think more, use less, that's, that's the mantra. So a bit, a, a bit of the engineering stuff now. For, for us, as engineers to know what we could do in terms of adding additional stories, we need to know what it's capable of supporting. We need to know as much as possible about, about the existing building and, and any capacity that might be in there. So we need to get into the mindset of the original designers of the time, looking back through the original building codes, for example. So we learned that the, this building uh, was designed for two and a half kilonewtons per meter squared. And that's, that's the same as what we would expect for an office today as well. Um, looking through the archive information as well, as you can see, it's, it's pretty ropey, but we can still gain information from this. So, for example, we can tell what type of reinforcement was used, the types of slab that the building used, and the fact that it used concrete in case steel beams, for example. And what we're looking for as engineers is any spare capacity that exists within that existing structure. So for a, a concrete building, for example, we designed for the concrete strength at 28 days, but it continues to gain strength as it cures. So we can, we can take that enhanced concrete strength and we can use that to our advantage when we're retrofitting our buildings. Um, the basement levels, I mentioned um, a change in use. So for car parking, um, the loads we'd expect on that would be around 150 to 200 kilograms a meter squared. But, but for gym use, we were looking at five. So we, we have to be really careful about how we justify the extra load that we're adding on the structure. So initially we, we talked um, to the gym, we pushed them. We want to understand exactly where those heavy loads are going to be to avoid uh, strengthening the whole building. And the client did consider strengthening the whole of the basement to the tune of about half a million pounds, but credit to them, they were willing to take the, allow the time and take the risk on program for us to go in and do some detailed analysis and design and see how much we could get out of the structure with no guarantees at the end that, that we wouldn't necessarily have to strengthen the whole thing. So what we did was we went in, we took concrete cores, to see how what, what the strength of the concrete was, how much strength has it gained. Um, this is uh, someone doing some ferrous scanning. So looking into the concrete um, at the reinforcement, see what, what the reinforcement and where the reinforcement is. And what we found was actually 80% of that basement had the capacity 
for the existing loads, which vastly reduced the amount of strength strengthening works required. So not only a saving for the client, but, but look how much carbon we saved in doing that exercise as well, over a hundred tons of CO2, the equivalent of 34 family cars running for a year. It's, it's, it's really something that, that's, that's a, sell, a saving well worth having. Um, and Canon Green, as it is today, we also designed a, a fab new stair for them. This is the, this is the bar that's under that stair. Um, this is the office space. Like I say, we put in a small raised access floor, but in order to maximize the floor to ceiling heights, took away the ceilings and, and it's a really nice space. And I think goes to show that the carbon agenda doesn't come at the expense of quality in the design. It doesn't mean a boring building. The architectural design, of course, you're saying is still really important for creating welcome spaces. Um, and a few images of the basement as well. So when we're looking at adding extra stories to a building, where we start looking is, like I say, where we have capacity in the existing building. And there's been fluctuations over time, um, particularly for offices in how much load those offices are designed for. And we've tracked it and we've put it into this, into this visual here. So what we found is there's a peak over here around in, in the 1920s and another in the 1980s. And the 1980s is actually not code driven, but developer driven um, by some desire to show, look, look how much, you know, you can do anything with this building. There's loads of capacity and you don't need to worry. So these are the buildings that we need to go looking for. These are the ones that are likely to have capacity. Um, and and the, reason, the reason as well for, for um, especially office load exchanging because, because we don't use them in the same way. Um, up here, this is maybe an office, maybe up to the 1990s, absolutely, it's full of filing cabinets, full of paper, full of plan chests, compared with an office today, it's, it's really striking how difference, how much difference there is. So, for example, in this table here, we've, we've compared an existing building with new, and it was originally designed for 400 kilograms a meter squared for an office. And today we only need two and a half. It's arguable, I would say we, we even need two and a half if you think how many people took their offices home with them during lockdown to their homes, which are designed for maybe half of that. I've, I've not heard of anyone's you know, bedroom floor falling in. So this is where we can find capacity in the structure counting carbon as well, we, we can quantify it when we're assessing options for different build scenarios. So um, there's a lot going on here, but I'll just touch on a couple, a couple of points. So over here, you can see um, where, where the embodied carbon comes from and steel and concrete as well is a, is a major portion of the embodied carbon. We've got the scores rating here as well, which is a, a structural carbon rating um, by the institutional structural engineers. And this is, this is how we can score buildings from the structural side. So a typical new build office building, it's, it's down here around 300 in, in the red zone where we don't want to be. Um, but looking at retrofit, we can get up here between A and A plus. And even when we're retrofitting our buildings and adding new structure on new stories, extensions around the side, we're not down the scale, but we're still performing vastly better in terms of body carbon than a new build. I'm nearly there. This is where we want to be. This, this is where we can get to be, where we can get to be on retrofit. Um, I've talked a lot about carbon, but um, as, as well, the biodiversity, uh, making our, our cities much more manageable, able to adapt to those extreme weather events that we're associating with climate change. And not just buildings, the public realm as well. Jumping back to Park Hill here, we've recently completed um, the public realm works that are associated with phase two of development and it's looking absolutely fantastic. Um, this is a uh, London Bridge um, down in London. Um, actually very recently redesigned with, with the new station, but look, look how stark it is, how hard it is. We, 
we, we think it's a, a real shame and we think they could have done better. So um, this is a, a provocation that we've pulled together as a CGI at Civic Engineers. This is what we would like to see. So making the space more inclusive to other forms of transport, to active travel, using car as the guest principles. Um, we've got rain gardens here to collect the rainfall, trees as well for shade and biodiversity, just a much more beautiful space. So in closing, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate a statistic that popped up earlier. 80% of the buildings that we'll have in 2050 have already been built. But that doesn't mean we have to stop improving them. There's so much we can do in research, design and analysis that will allow us to add additional stories and retrofit our buildings. So how can we as engineers help you get the most out of your buildings? How can we maximise the potential? Get us involved early. We can investigate the building. We can see what capacity might be there. Do, do your surveys, get your information. The more information you can get, the more you can know about your existing building, the better. And we can take these existing buildings, this, this heritage that we've acquired from our predecessors and we can reuse them, repurpose them, bring them up to date, make them fit for function, energy efficient and, and beautiful as well. So, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Hannah. That was, uh... That was really eye-opening and uh you know two really uh fascinating case studies there um there were a couple of things on the chat that i wanted to pick up on um i mean jeff said personally i prefer the original uh, edition of canon green now i i guess there is this there will always be a bit of a conflict between preserving the the, the look of a building um with the need to move with the times and, and maybe take on, uh, you know, you, you talked about how offices are used now versus how they were used, on, for example, when that building was, was first built, the loads are different. That then means that you can do more with the, the existing structure. Um, but I, I mean, how do you square that circle? I mean, the, the, in, in Sheffield, you know, the, the, a lot of the original um the, the, they are recognizably still of that of that uh, the, the, they're still recognizing the flats that were built uh, when they were originally built but they have obviously changed a bit so how do you think you can square the circle between retaining the original look of a building and uh maximizing the benefits of the existing structure and, and adding to those benefits which i guess is what you're really talking about here yeah, yeah. So it's that it's that calculation, I suppose, where it is it's embodied carbon versus a number of other factors. And, and I think the important thing to say is the embodied carbon aspect, it needs to be part of the assessment, it needs to be part of the conversation, which it hasn't been previously. I mean, the, normally it's cost quality time, you can pick two. Mm. Um, carbon, carbon needs to be brought into that as well as, as a really important consideration when when you're when you're dealing with these existing buildings yeah the, the the other i think really interesting thing that you um alluded to uh, well at the start of the presentation and actually at the end was was looking at the sort of the, the whole picture so not just the buildings but the the spaces around them and uh, the transport systems that are used and uh, how people experience the particular locations where those buildings are uh, are um, now that is easy to easier to do if all of that is in the same ownership. Um, but if you have a, a building, um, you know, on a particular plot of land, I'm thinking. Uh, I mean, even even Brotherton House, you know, Pat, the, the building that Pat talked about. You know, that the, there is a bit of public realm around that building, and Pat talked about actually going outside of the red line to, to do some works beyond the beyond the, the sort of curtilage of that building but you do have the inner ring road which 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 um you know is, is a really big imposition so how do you sort of how can you tackle those sorts of issues holistically when actually the ownerships are in different hands and maybe the motivations of the different owners might be different no it is is a really good point and and yeah there can there can be a lot of blockers um that come into that but i think i think we can't just have a blinkered approach of it's it's the buildings we have to we do have to think think wider and, and you know it's 
let, let's lead by example on, on our projects and, and we'll do it on our little parcel and, and you know, it will, you know, it will shine for itself and, and hopefully others will, will see what we're doing and, and they'll come along on the journey with us. Absolutely. Claude, I'll let you come in and give your pearls of wisdom here at this point. <laughs> You're on silent, Claude. I didn't know that Sheffield had been done in three, the um, Park Hill had been done in three different stages with different methods. Mm. And I find that really fascinating because I, I have often wondered whether um, the reluctance to retrofit or refurbish old buildings doesn't come hand in hand with the fact that we don't necessarily understand them at the point when we take them on. And here um, you've mentioned the traders and actually just developing some skills to do it in a more efficient way as you went along. Is there any, any report about this? And uh, um, what, was it simply because nobody understood these structures and didn't know quite how to deal with them? Or is it because gradually as you went by, you realized the building had more potential than originally thought? Um. I, I think it perhaps starts with initially with with a reluctance. Maybe like this is this is too this is too difficult. It will cost too much. It will take too much time. But as we've gone on, as, as you can see through the different phases, you know, we've we've um, really learned ourselves, and, and the whole team has just what what we can get out of this existing structure and you know conserve the carbon. So it was. It was as much about changing minds and mindsets um, as, as finding the right products um, for the job. And do you know whether anyone in the team has actually gone on to do other projects that were similar on the basis of the experience they acquired? I, um, I include builders in this, um, you, you know, the, the, the actual builders who were on site and doing this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on, on that one, but I can I can go away and, and follow that up and, and, and find out. I'd, I'd like to think yeah. so. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see a whole case study book written on this, um, you know, going past. And I think that also applies to gardening in buildings um, in the sense that it's very I mean, I teach architecture and one of the sessions will be about education. Um, not only of architects, but the whole next generation. And um, it's really hard to find good case studies to put to students um, if the course allows you to fit it in in the first place. So um, it, it'd be nice to have a, a record, a repository of these experiences so that more and more can be shared and speed up the process of understanding mm -hmm. better these old buildings. Yeah, that, that's why we, we really like to do these presentations because we get to shout about yeah, these absolutely. really cool projects. Yeah. yeah. And and we'll, as I say, we'll be we'll be putting a um a video of this on online and we, we do get a lot of people watching us. So um I think you know that 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 will hopefully uh, spread the spread the word. And um it's been a fascinating hour or so. Uh, we are at two o'clock, so I am gonna draw things to a close. Um next week we are looking at um uh, expertise, the expertise issue, which I think is a very important one. You know, we can have these ideas about what we want to do with these buildings, but have we got the people who can actually practically uh, implement them? Uh, so that's what we're going to do next week. But um, I'd just like to thank you all, uh, Oriel, uh, Pat and Hannah, uh, for giving such uh, fascinating talks uh, this afternoon and to Claude for chipping in and uh, drawing, drawing out the discussion Really appreciate that and uh, we'll see you all next week but uh, thank you all very much